Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished participants and co-chairs of this meeting, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Susilu Bangbang Yudhiono, President of the Republic of Indonesia and ASEAN Chair 2011. And from the country which has hosted this summit seven times more than any other country in the past two decades, we're very pleased to be joined by His Excellency Li Shen Lung, Prime Minister of the Republic of Singapore. Bapak President, on behalf of all of my colleagues and the representatives from civil society, government and industry at this meeting, I would like to extend our very sincere and deep appreciation for your personal commitment to the success of this year's meeting. And to the members of your cabinet who are not only present today, but who have lent their personal time and that of their ministries, their insights and their support, we wish to express all of our gratitude for such great collaboration. And now to commence the proceedings of the opening ceremony of the World Economic Economic Forum on East Asia, I invite my executive chairman and the founder of the World Economic Forum, Professor Klaus Schwab, to chair this session. Your Excellency, President Yuto Yono, Prime Minister Li Shenglong, it's a great pleasure to be here and welcome to the 2011 World Economic Forum on East Asia, celebrating our 20th anniversary. And we are convening here six, over 600 leaders from business, government, civil society, media and academia under the theme responding to the new globalism. Mr. President, this theme has been influenced by you. It reflects the risks and priority issues that you raised in your speech in Davos earlier this year, which was entitled The Big Shift and the Imperative of the 21st Century Globalism. The major strategic shifts you highlighted as new realities including the rise of the emerging economies, adapting to a new peace and security mindset, and transforming the economy to low carbon growth are being explored in our sessions today and tomorrow. We have four pillars for our program, managing global disruptions, ensuring employment and inclusive growth, leading through sustainability, and finally, new norms for Asia. I want to highlight the importance to be here in Indonesia. You, Mr. President, you do not represent only this year the Republic of Indonesia, but also being the chair of ASEAN, you have a wider role to play in the world of today. But Indonesia is a remarkable country. If I look, for example, at our competitiveness report, I have seen that you are the G20 a 20 economy, which has had the fastest and best improvements in our global competitiveness report since 2005. And let's not forget Indonesia is also the third fastest growing economy in the G20, just after China and India. And finally, particularly in the world of today, I think we should look also at the great success of the political transformation, social transformation, which has taken place in your country under your leadership. And it may serve as a very good example for many countries for a democracy, a stable democracy with a Muslim majority and a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. 
I should not forget in introducing Indonesia the young spirit of your country. And one of the figures which surprised me most is how much connected your society is. For example, the number of Facebook users in Indonesia is the second highest in the world, just after the US. And the highest number of tweets in Asia comes from Indonesia. For this reason, we have also decided to integrate our Facebook community into this meeting. And we have asked them to, to use the opportunity and uh, to ask also a question to the President. And actually, there were 72,000 Facebook fans responding. And at the end of our session today, I will ask you one question, uh, which we selected from the manifold um, uh, people in the Facebook community. But we can have only one question, but I would like to use this opportunity to thank all those in the Facebook community which have used this opportunity to, to be with us at least, at least virtually. Prime Minister Li Shenong, as it was mentioned, you were seven times the host of this East Asia Economic Summit. Uh, you are in some way a co-father. I am very pleased that you joined us here at this special um, uh, celebration of 20 years. I also would like to use this opportunity to congratulate you because you just have been re-elected uh, Prime Minister. And now, um, Mr. President, we are delighted to hear your special opening address. Thank you, Professor Swap, for your kind introductions. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon us. Prime Minister Li Shenlong, Prime Minister Subatar Badbul, Professor Klaus Swap, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by expressing a very warm welcome to Indonesia, to all the participants of the World Economic Forum. When I spoke in Davos last January, I drew attention to the various power shifts sweeping our world today and called for a 21st century globalism as a necessary response to new realities. I am glad that you pick up on the theme of globalism at this conference. A 21st century globalism should be different than the 20th century internationalism. In our time, globalism should be inclusive rather than exclusive. It should be pragmatic rather than dogmatic. It should it should unite rather than divide. It should be directed at addressing common global challenges rather than directed at certain groups of countries. It should be driven by the imperative of cooperation rather than confrontation, by collaboration rather than conquest. Asia must be at the center of this new globalism. For Asia today is not the same as Asia decade, let alone centuries ago. Modernization, development, democracy, open society, connectivity, these are all dramatically changing the face of Asia. Asia certainly has the resources, opportunity, and most importantly, confidence to shape the international system. 
The world is not short of ideas and facts. We have too many of them. What we lack and surely need is consensus. A global consensus is still missing in the climate debate. A consensus is still missing in the Doha round. A consensus is still missing in reforming global institutions. A consensus is still missing on how to rebalance the global economy. We will need this consensus if we are to withstand the political, strategic, and economic turbulences which are bound to come our way in the future. We are ushering in a new global era which do not yet have a name and whose precise features are only coming to form. There are still some tensions, some pushes and pulls between the old world and the new world, which is normal. Every transition, every transformation takes time and toil. This is something that we in Indonesia know only too well. Against the backdrops of constant change and against all odds, Indonesia has been rather fortunate to be where we are now. If I am asked what is the best way to describe Indonesia, I would say this, uniquely resilient and remarkably adaptive. Indonesia has survived many trials and tribulations, financial crisis, political instability, riots, avian flu, constitutional crisis, ethnic conflict, separatism, terrorist attack, and natural disasters. Today, Indonesia stands proud as the world's third largest democracy, Southeast Asia's largest economy, an emerging economy with political stability, with independent and active foreign policy, and as member of the G20, and as founding member, and this year chairman of ASEAN. I am particularly pleased that the Indonesia economy is going stronger. Of course, we still have plenty of problems, relating to poverty, inequity, corruption, infrastructure, and bureaucratic inefficiency. Still, our purchasing power parity GDP is approaching one trillion US dollars, and we aim to be in the world's top 10 largest economy in coming decades. We have a balanced budget owing to prudent fiscal policy. Our debt to GDP ratio is 26%, the lowest in history. Our trade volume and foreign reserve are at record high. Foreign investment is rising subtly. In recent years, we have implemented what is arguably the largest anti-poverty pro-poor programs in Indonesia's modern history, which is part of our growth with equity development strategy. We have recently launched a master plan to accelerate and expand the Indonesian economy in the next 15 years. Professor Swab has asked me to share with you some lessons from Indonesia's transformational story. Well, my answer would be several things. To begin with, during the entire roller coaster ride, we always had fit in and clung to the essentials of being Indonesia, freedom, diversity, harmony, tolerance, tradition and unity. Without this essential, Indonesia would not be Indonesia. In recent times, democracy has come to be part of our national DNA, all the way to the grassroots. Even when our politics and the economy were under tours, we never stopped believing in these essentials. Another reason for our progress is that, despite the sea of uncertainty, we were, not, we were not shy to change, to adapt, and to reinvent Indonesia. Sure, there were questions, doubts, anxieties, fear. But every turning point, the leaders and the people made the courageous step forward. Time and again, Indonesia did not resist, but sought and embraced change as a matter of necessity. Of course, none of Indonesia's transformation was possible unless there was a change of mindset. Indonesia now have a confident attitude about our country and our place in the world. We are no longer stigmatized by our colonial past. 
and are eager to claim our place in the global future. We are driven by opportunity, not fear. I notice that this newfound confidence is not particular to Indonesia. You can see it throughout Asia. In my heart, I do believe that Asia's moment has come and that a much brighter future lies ahead. But we cannot take these things for granted. Let me suggest several ways by which we can make Asia the continent of the future. First, Asia must be part of the solution to address the global imbalances. The world economy cannot afford to rely on strong growth in emerging economies alone. We need healthy growth globally, including in the developed world. One way or another, we all need to make structural adjustments to correct the global imbalances. Asia, more than any other region, can help achieve a strong, sustainable, and balanced world economy. Asia must also lead the way to keep markets and societies open. Second, Asia needs to anticipate and address the growing pressures that will come from food, energy, and water insecurity. Of the 7 billion people that now inhabit our planet, 60% live in Asia. As their economies grow, they will seek and compete for finite natural resources, a pattern that is in previous centuries led to wars, conquests, exploitation, and untold suffering. In our time, these issues need not lead to conflict, be it in the Mekong River or in the South China Sea. We can find creative ways to turn potential conflict into potential cooperation. Given the proportion of the population in Asia and therefore its use of resources and need for food, Asia should also lead by example in terms of sustainable growth. Third, Asia must do all we can to become the center of global innovation. Technology, more than ever, will be the key driver of change in the 21st century. With all the problems of poverty, marginalization, inequity, and degradation that are still prevalent throughout Asia, technology may well be the key to resolve them. Asia should not just to try to catch up. It can leapfrog into the future. And these days, innovation and technology can come from anywhere. There is a growing force of innovators and techies from Bangalore to Bandung, from Singapore to Shenzhen, that can produce homegrown innovation with global application. Fourth, Asia must step into its best emerging resource, the youth. The youth today are becoming a generation unlike any other before them. They are much more connected, more open, more creative, and more active. Through the internet and social media networks such as Facebook and Twitter, the youth are developing a sense of transgenerational consciousness, a feeling of mutual empathy and shared hopes. We need to encourage this rather than resist it. The youth also feel strong entitlement for their future and want to be agents of change, as we have seen in the Middle East. It is therefore important for Asian countries to provide them with the skill and opportunities so they can become the most dynamic and productive part of society. If these youth grow to be entrepreneurs, innovators, and pioneers in their field, the, reward, the rewards for Asia will be incalculable. Finally, the faith Asia needs to preserve and build on what is best about Asia a rich diversity. Asia is home to the world order civilization and religions. It is also the continent with the greatest number of ethnic groups and dialects. In the age of globalization, it would be most ironic if Asia were to fall behind others in creating a peaceful multicultural world. Asia's future lies in our ability to preserve the condition of culture, civilizational, I should say, of cultural, civilizational, and religious harmony, 
that for centuries and millennia have been part of the Asian way of life. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can do all this, then we shall be able to claim our time as the Asian century. And we can be sure that Asian century means a century of progress and peace and one of the cooperation and collaboration. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Your speech was so comprehensive that it is difficult to, to start now a discussion. Uh, you, you answered practically all the questions which I had written down. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and I will start with you, uh, Prime Minister, because you have been so um, active in this field uh, there are now many different regional arrangements in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Asia. Uh, is this contributing to a stronger voice of the region, or is it having a dilutive effect? And I may immediately ask one uh, additional question. How do you maintain in the ASEAN uh, context your identity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and with the EU, the United States. Well, firstly, on the multiplicity of groupings which we belong to, uh, ASEAN itself is, of course, one important grouping. Then we have ASEAN plus various other partners, plus ones, one by one. We have ASEAN plus three, which is a northeastern Asian partners, China, Japan, and South Korea. We belong to the East Asia Summit, which brings in a wider group with India, Australia and New Zealand, and we belong to APEC, which brings in countries, the US and countries on the other side of the Pacific. It's very untidy, it's an alphabet soup, it means a lot of meetings and overlappings, but I think overall it's an organic uh, architecture which is gradually developing, which has helped us to strengthen our ties with one another. I. Uh, there's a lot of temptation to try to make things neater, but I think that it's wiser to accept the untidiness and to let the, organ let the structures evolve organically over time as the relationships grow, as the cooperation deepens, then the structures will adapt to suit this cooperation. We don't know what the shape of the future will be. We hope that Asia, we believe Asia will be a big part of the 21st century, but we will not be the only part of the story. America remains a very powerful country. Europe has a lot of potential, even though it has difficulties now. And we have to link up with these different parts of the world. And an organic architecture which can evolve and be flexible and resilient is part of this. You asked about America and China and ASEAN. Well, both America and China are very important partners of ASEAN. America for many, many years since Second World War. Uh, China increasingly in recent times and particularly over the last decade or two. Uh, we'd like to strengthen our ties with both of them. We'd like to be friends with both of them, cooperate in many areas. And we see great potential in China's prosperity and development and its extending of its relations all over Asia potential for trade, potential for tourism, potential for investments into China as well as from China into different countries in Asia, including in the Indonesia and other ASEAN countries. And we hope that this will continue. One thing it depends on, that China remains on good terms with America. Then it's easier for us to be friends with both. <laughs> and long may that continue. This gives, this gives me opportunity, uh, Mr. President, to take up the question which was asked uh, by one person in the um, social community, in the Facebook community. And um, the question is, comes from Aaron Anand Aracha, and he writes, Dear President, I'm a Malaysian 
student, and I'm a firm believer in, a, in the closer regional integration of ASEAN countries. Where do you see ASEAN 10 to 15 years down the road? Yes. <clears throat> uh, in my view, by 2020 or 2025, 10 to 15 years from now, ASEAN will be getting stronger, the more cohesive, and economically uh, more integrated. Under new charter, we endeavor to be a big community, the ASEAN community, that is in essence an economic community, a social, cultural community, and also political and security community. Uh, of course, ASEAN is not the same as European Union, but one thing, ASEAN today is more structured, more rules-based, more unified, and having better uh, policy coordinations. Uh, our strategic long-term agenda, ASEAN wants to be uh, strong a pillar, important pillar in the region, the economic pillar. ASEAN wants to be uh, playing more important roles in maintaining peace, stability, and order in the region, especially in the Pacific Asia uh, region. And of course, the spirit is now ASEAN want to connect our association with the global community of nations. That is the future of ASEAN in my view. And of course, ASEAN must do more. We have to uh, deal with so many challenges internally as well as externally, but I believe very strongly we are on the right track and we will be able to achieve our goals. And for the young leaders, I am hoping, especially young leaders of ASEAN, uh, 10 to 15 years from now is your time. You will assume better roles and leadership to continue our endeavor to achieve our uh, great goals to be ASEAN community that is also contributing to the maintenance of global peace, and stability, justice, and prosperity. That's, that's my answer. Thank you. Prime Minister, I, I may follow up this question. When you look at Europe uh, and you compare it with uh, ASEAN um, or Asian uh, integration, uh, the European Union may have some difficulties at the moment whereby I'm personally optimist that those difficulties will be overcome. Um, but there, is, there are shared values underneath. So it's, there is a common commitment to certain principles, particularly principles of democracy, which are missing in some of the ASEAN uh, countries. How do you see the evolution of this situation? Well, I think ASEAN is in a different situation from Europe. Europe, as you say, has, shares many more common values amongst the member countries of the European Union. And of course, you are many years ahead of ASEAN in the work of economic integration. You started after the war, and this is 50, 60 years worth of effort. Uh, ASEAN is much more diverse. It's not just um, political values, but also the histories, the cultures, the colonial past where we have had different uh, colonial um, metropolitan governments and therefore countries have developed in different ways. But what we can do is to bring ourselves together and find common ground where we can and put aside those areas where we are different for the future for another day. We know we have to do this. If you look at 2020 or 2030, China will be a much more developed and prosperous country even than now. India will also have made considerable progress. And if ASEAN is going to be part of the story, we have to be much more integrated amongst ourselves, and we have to be much better linked up, both with China and India, and also with the rest of the world, with America, with Europe, with Latin America, even Africa. 
And that's what ASEAN needs to do as a strategic imperative in the next phase. Because unless the 10 countries of ASEAN can come together effectively, you may have titles, you may have meetings, but if you are not a practical, meaningful economic community, an integrated economic community, you will fall off the radar screen and it will be to, be, be to the considerable detriment of our peoples. It's very interesting to compare ASEAN and uh, Asia and Europe in this respect. After World War II, as you mentioned, we had the development of a true European identity. Now the problem of Europe is in face of problems to still prioritize the European identity over the, over the national identity. And as I see in Asia, it's just different. You are in the process of developing an Asian identity. Uh, would, you, would you agree with this? I, I think uh, we are qualitatively different. Uh, between France and Germany, you fought wars for many years or, or centuries, but basically it's one European culture. And after the Second World War, with visionary leaders on both sides, came together and it, you, you formed the nucleus of a European community. In Asia, we have not fought wars with one another, but our cultures are very different. The religions are different. The, the traditions go back to different great civilizations, the Indian civilization, the Chinese civilization, as well as influence from uh, Western civilizations, the Americans who were uh, a colonial power in the Philippines. So to come together and to form one Asian identity I think is probably one visionary objective beyond the next. One day we may get there, but right now we are focused on uh, practical cooperation which will yield us uh, practical benefits for the members. Even if, if you could say um, one basic element of the Asian culture is Confucius, and if I take Europe, uh, Plato, and when you read the two, there are so many similarities. Um, so hopefully we will develop one day shared values in the world. Well, all the great religions share many common values, but I think they will remain different great religions for a long time to come. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me turn to a more an economic issue. Um, um, how well, if I, if, uh, when, if I take our uh, annual uh, global risk report, one of the major risks which was identified was a strong slowdown of the Chinese economy and a continued increase in currency volatility, particularly giving the further devaluation, possible devaluation of the dollar and considering the yuan pact to it. And um, I, I may ask first you, Mr. President, and uh, Prime Minister, you, you have also your experience as head of the monetary board. So you certainly um, are quite uh, equipped to answer to this question. But Mr. President. Yes, uh, in my view, uh, there are many issues to be settled in our global economy. The, we discuss in depth in various forums, in the G20, in APEC, in ASEAN, in, in many forums. Uh, of course, their perspectives are different. Uh, we have to discuss about uh, global economic imbalances, about the use of currency, uh, the uh, national interest versus global and regional interests. So what we have to do is actually uh, we have to find um, our common interests, uh, how to uh, overcome the situation uh, properly, uh, how to put a, a proper balance between our own interests, our national interests versus other interests. And of course, uh, it's not easy sometimes uh, if we are talking about, for example, uh, we discuss again and again in the G20 forum about policy coordination. Um, what kind of coordination can realistically be achieved in these connections? So, uh, in my view, uh, what we need is 
uh, to continue having uh, dialogue, having uh, not only meeting, I mean, um, cooperation to find uh, realistic uh, and uh, say achievable solution that can benefit all. I would like to answer in a general terms and these connections. And the spirit is, in my view, there are many, so there are many critical questions to address uh, globally, uh, but um, with uh, our ability to find a proper balance uh, among all interests is uh, the key. Prime Minister, I, I take up the question again, and I would uh, formulate it in a maybe provocative way. Would you welcome a rise of or a, a revaluation or of Xi Yuan? I think that's a very sharp question. <laughs> uh, if you put it like that, my answer is no. But I would say that a gradual realignment of currencies is helpful. Helpful both for the overall balance and also helpful for China itself because it can be part of the restructuring which has to take place in China. A restructuring to become less reliant on export-led growth and to have a greater component of domestic demand, whether this be investments or consumption, and to have a spreading of the benefits of growth away from the export sector towards the rest of the economy, the domestic workers, the farmers, the people inland, which would result with a gradual appreciation of the uh, renminbi. I think that this is an argument which has been made and which even Chinese uh, uh, economists and scholars would acknowledge has some weight. How to balance that against the political difficulty of raising an exchange rate which will affect the export industry and therefore risk causing unemployment which could cause political difficulties. That's something which the Chinese leadership have to judge and uh, I think between them and the Americans, they will discuss this very carefully. <laughs> and I think they have been doing so. And from what I can see, they've avoided a collision so far and hope they continue to make yeah. progress. May, may I follow up this uh, issue with a related question? Um, it seems to be, uh, be the case that some Asian countries are now very much confronting the challenge of inflation and uh, economic growth. Uh, yes, you, indeed. What, what, is your, what is your recipe to, to address this issue? Well, if the Americans put their house in order, that will help a great deal. <laughs> but this is because global monetary conditions are abnormal, it's awash with liquidity, interest rates are almost zero, and so money is running around looking for investments, and if you don't trust uh, investing it on Wall Street in the American stock market, then you look for other investments in emerging markets. And the result is you get property prices, asset prices go up in the emerging markets, which causes many problems. Hong Kong is experiencing this. The Chinese, I think, have also been experiencing this. Singapore has seen it too. Our property market has, has seen very drastic increases over the last two years to our concern. Uh, but, the, but it's an open global economy, and you cannot completely cut yourself off Neither is it easy for any individual country to solve the problem by itself. That's our dilemma. Now, Mr. President, in your, in your speech, you outlined the importance of innovation. Um, if I look at China, China is turning out at the moment 6.5 million graduates, as far as I understand, every year, more than half or around half in technical scientific uh, areas. Now, what does it mean for the business model of, of the countries in the region? Uh, China, also based on the 12th five-year plan, um, shall become a formidable competitor in uh, innovation-based <coughs> industries. Now, where do, you, where do you see the competitiveness of a country like yours uh, based on raw materials, based on production, based on innovation, or probably a mix. Would you like to address this issue? Yes, I think 
each country wants to improve its competitiveness. Uh, for Indonesia, we are realizing that we should know, we should only uh, base our economy from the conventional sector such as our agriculture, our industry, our current services. We have to do more to improve our competitiveness. I fully understand that uh, the role of education is very important to improve the quality of our human capital. That's why we are also now working very hard to uh, produce more uh, new uh, talented workforce in Indonesia. We are improving our education, our universities to uh, be able to compete in, in, in today's globalization. Uh, I uh, understand that uh, countries like India has uh, great competitiveness in uh, uh, information technology in the services. China uh, does have the same capabilities besides manufacturing. Uh, Indonesia is, of course, not only developing uh, its, its own resources, such as mining industry, but we have to ensure that we could also improve our um, uh, technology, our know-how, our skills, our science, and also the uh, innovation capability. We. Uh, will follow the path of the uh, successful country in being able to improve the competitiveness through improving the quality of uh, their human capital. Prime Minister Li Shenglong, we in, in the speech uh, of the President, he addressed already the issue of the young, young population, but um, when you run a democracy, or you don't run a democracy, but if you lead in a democracy, um, I, I, would, uh, I would say this phenomenon of empowerment of young people. And I, I should say, I mean, uh, there was some indication in your country um, of dissatisfaction, but I have to add immediately, every European leader would be happy to get uh, more than 60% approval rate uh, in, in elections. But how do you um, integrate this very impatient idealism? I would say it's, it's usually idealism, which you see in the young generation, but it's impatient and it's direct. Uh, you have to listen to it. How would you see to incorporate this in a democratic system of decision-making? Well, this is a challenge which all countries have to face, all societies have to face, because with the social media, with the Internet, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, and with instant communications and feedback, uh, we have a completely different generation now arising. They are the future. They are the ones whom we hope will take our societies forward and we hope that we'll be able to provide them the skills and the preparation so that they can build a better life for themselves than we have had. And yet, we have to ask how can we fit in the, the expectations, the values, the habits of thought of a generation where you communicate instantly and immediately you know the answers to questions to a world which has changed but not change to such an extent that you can get everything which you want immediately you want it. And that is a challenge. Uh, we have to be of that generation. You must have leaders who are able to talk to them, to, to, to talk with them and communicate with the young. You have to be in that media to know how to operate on Facebook and Twitter. As some of us do, some of us not so well. Uh, because uh, we didn't grow up with this. But as an institution, we have to learn to do that. And we have to learn to be in sync with that generation so that you can express those aspirations in a constructive way. And yet, as the years pass, as the challenges come, educate a new generation as to what in the world has not yet changed 
and how they have to adapt so that they can thrive and prosper in the 21st century. When we look at the G20 process, um, Mr. President, you are uh, part of the G20 process. Um, Prime Minister, you are not directly. Uh, so I may ask both of you, as an insider and a quasi-outsider, what do you expect from the G20? And here I may add one particular question. Um, East Asia is very dependent on certain agricultural and mineral commodities. And one of the issues, for example, of, on the agenda of this year G20 is uh, to, to see whether a stronger, I would say, regulation or supervision of commodities market is, markets is needed. Mr. President, do you oh, yes. <coughs> as an insider? Yes. Uh, I would like to start by saying that, in my view, the G20 can do several things, but cannot do everything because G20 should not uh, claim that uh, we are representing all nations even though the uh, structure and the composition is about okay. It's better than, for example, G7, G8 or BRICS. Uh, we in the G20 uh, are representing developed nations, emerging economies, as well as developing nations. So actually, uh, the forum should be able to uh, accommodate, to identify uh, the real issue of our uh, economy, the global economy, I mean. And the G20 should also understand the interests of all nations, the develop, uh, developing and as, as well as emerging uh, countries. By uh, addressing those issues and challenges, I believe that the uh, solution to make by the G20 will be uh, answering to a certain degree the real issue that we are facing together in our economy. Uh, and country like Indonesia and other developing nations uh, that are part of the G20 can also express the concern, the interest of developing nations, such as the issue of development, narrowing gap of the, the, the development, financial inclusion, uh, combating poverty, and others. So for me, uh, if the G20 uh, continue uh, uh, playing positive roles by uh, realizing that the G20 must address all issues that are faced by all countries in the world, so the G20 will be still relevant as a premier forum for uh, uh, today's um, re uh, global architecture and economic realm. Um, second point you are mentioning, uh, Professor Swap, about uh, the regulation to make in the G20. Regulation is needed, of course. Uh, Overregulated is not good, but uh, in my view, uh, markets can go unregulated. Appropriate regulation is needed to ensure that we could prevent unnecessary, unnecessary crisis that may happen because of lack of regulation in our global economy. So it depends on uh, what kind of regulation to make, but uh, on the one hand, if you are mentioning about uh, the uh, natural resources, food, commodities, then uh, the idea is to ensure that we are still maintaining uh, open uh, economy, uh, open trade and investment, while also uh, protecting other interests uh, uh, of our, uh, I should say, our development, uh, the, the environment, etc. So uh, regulation is needed, uh, but um, in my view, regulation should not hinder the efficiency of the market that uh, other uh, market mechanisms, uh, I should say other rules that we need to ensure that global economy is uh, moving uh, well, uh, getting more, getting stronger, 
uh, more balanced and more sustainable. Prime Minister. Well, I think the G20 is a practical compromise. The world's problems are complex and interrelated. We are all involved one way or the other. If you have all 200 odd countries in the world involved in a conference, the meeting will never end. On the other hand, if you have just a handful of countries involved settling things for everybody else, uh, the solutions will not be accepted. So somewhere in between the two, you have to find the right compromise to have the key participants represented. Everybody feels he has a look in directly or indirectly and able to reach some consensus as to the right way forward. And the G20 is an effort to do this. It's bigger than the G8, and it's much smaller than the whole of the UN. Uh, but of course, by itself, even the G20 cannot solve all the problems. So Singapore has, we are not a member of the G20. I, we attended the last summit in Seoul, and I am intent, I'm, I've been invited to attend the next summit in, uh, in Cannes, in, in France, this year. But we have tried to make ourselves useful by um, participating in what we call, what is called the Global Governance Group, a group of 20-odd small countries at the UN who get together, compare notes, share our common concerns, and therefore hope thereby, by making common cause, to have a more effective voice in forums uh, like the G20. We are coming... Um to the end uh, of the session, and we will have a traditional formal opening uh, short ceremony. Um, but before doing so, um, Mr. President, Prime Minister, we have here um, quite a number of top business leaders in the room. What would be your message to those if you look at the next 10 years? create uh, employment, what, what do you want to tell the business leaders here in Seoul? In one or two sentences. Are you satisfied with all the business leaders uh, concerning <laughs> social responsibility, inclusiveness, and yes. so on, or do you have any? I any want to say one sentence. Uh, we need our collaborations in achieving better growth in creating more jobs in, in reducing poverty while protecting our environment. Prime Minister? Well, I think you are an important part of the solution to the world's problems. So if you can continue to generate prosperity for your companies and for your economies, and continue to encourage your governments to keep your economies open, to keep markets working, to, keep the be to help the benefits spread to as wide a proportion of the population as possible. Then I think we can have a stable world where we can evolve and transform ourselves quickly and get to a better tomorrow. Otherwise, you can have see all the opportunities, but something can go wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I would please uh, join me in thanking um, uh, President Yuto Yono um, and Prime Minister Li Shenlong uh, for having been part of this opening session and provided us and having provided us with some insights in the present situation. And I would like to, to add here one sentence, uh, Mr. President. Um, I would uh, like to thank you for the great hospitality we find here. We have, uh, since you came to Davos, we have uh, enlarged our um, ties with, and strengthened our ties with uh, Indonesia and have now quite a strong um, contingent of uh, the business community being part of the World Economic Forum. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And Prime Minister, I'm looking forward to the day we are back in uh, Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in expressing our gratitude. And now to inaugurate the 20th anniversary of the World Economic Forum in East Asia, together with President of Indonesia, 
I invite to the stage Mari Elka Pangestu, Minister of Trade, and Pahata Rajasa, the Coordinating Minister of Economic Affairs, for the traditional Indonesian gong ceremony.